So tonight, our little discussion is based upon the experiences traveling the state and meeting with uh, people that we call friends and people we call relatives. And it struck me that the humor, the insight, the individuality of what we term the Down East Yankee is something that may pass into oblivion unless perhaps we make note of it. Being a native of the state, I don't think that what we're going to discuss here tonight is something that could be termed uh, uh, out of place in looking at our own brethren and describing them in the light which, uh, quite frankly, I'm proud of. It's rugged individualism, something that uh, perhaps is fast passing from view. Perhaps these people live by a code which uh, I like to paraphrase is doing unto others that in which they ask you to do only. For example, uh, there were two farmers by the name of Eben and Sam who'd had adjoining farms for about 20 years. Their paths used to cross every morning at the crest of the hill as they went to the field. For 20 years, the conversation had always been the same. Morning, Eben. Morning, Sam. Occasionally, they'd meet coming home at night. The conversation was, Evening, Eben. Evening, Sam. One day, after 20 years of such discussion, they had what you might call an elongated conversation. It went like this. Morning, Eben. Morning, Sam. Say, Eben, now what you say you fed your hoss when he had the glanders? I fed him kerosene, Sam. Morning. Two days in a row, they had another one of these extended conversations. Morning, Eben. Morning, Sam. Say, Eben, uh, what you say you fed your hoss when he had the glanders? I fed him kerosene, Sam. So died. My horse died. So did mine. <laughs> Morning. Morning. <laughs> Traveling the state, uh, as I described to you a few years back, there was an occurrence that happened one Sunday. And might I say that one thing I enjoyed about traveling the state of Maine was the opportunity to uh, purchase produce at the side of the road during the various seasons. Sweet corn, peas, uh, cider in the fall, and so forth. This particular Sunday, a group of us were coming back from Caribou, and we happened to stop at what you could term a local crossroad uh, community store where they had a particularly inviting display of goods. And as we went in to pay uh, for our purchase, there, sitting around the pot belly stove in the proverbial scene, were two local swains who were discussing the previous Saturday night. And the conversation we overheard went something like this. Eben, what you do last Saturday night? I went to the county dance. He says, you didn't. Says, yes, I did. Where I did. Yes, I did. Well, what you do there? He says, well, he said, I danced with the Peabody gal. He said, you did. Says, yes, I did. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Well, what you doing? The dance is over. I said, well, I hitched up the rig and took her home. He says, you didn't. Says, yes, I did. Yes, I did. Yeah. Said, what you do there? He said, well, <laughs> he says, I got out the blanket and put over our knees. He says, you didn't. Says, yes, I did. Very did. Very did. Well, what you do after that? He says, well, I put my arm around her a mite. He says, you didn't. Says, yes, I did. Yes, I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, what you do then? He says, well, he said. Uh, <laughs> I kind of held a hand a spell. He says, you didn't. Says, yes, I did. Yes, I did. <laughs> well, what'd you do then? He said, well, he said, I put my hand down on her knee. He says, you didn't. Says, yes, I did. Yes, I did. What, uh, what'd you do then? He said, well, he said, I put it up on my father. He says, you didn't. Says, yes, I did. Yes, I did. And what did it feel like? He says, I don't know. I had my mittens on. <laughs> Just to prove that uh, the young fellows here in the state aren't uh, completely at a loss for that situation, uh, I would like to tell you about one young couple up in North Wyndham that got married right out of high school. Now, this young couple uh, was perhaps better off than some others up in the area, that uh, they were rather well-known and quite successful in school and well-thought-of. 
And they had the advantage of starting out married life uh, with a farm of their own. And uh, <clears throat> it was a successful farm. And in several years of married life, they had done very well. The crops had been well, and uh, they participated in the various activities in the community. And they were thought of in uh, 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 very good terms. There was only one problem. Every time this young fellow got the urge to take his wife to bed, he was always out in the field plowing. Now, as I might have mentioned, uh, this was a rather large spread that they owned. And when he got that urge, uh, he, of course, took off at the farmhouse. <laughs> and by the time he got there, with the running and all, and the size of the place, why, uh, <laughs> you're getting ahead of me a little bit. Good thing. <laughs> by the time he got there, of course, there was no urge left. <laughs> Now, after two years of married life, you can imagine that uh, this was a rather frustrated young couple. So finally, after much prevailing on the part of his wife, he agreed that he would uh, stop by the local uh, dock when he was in town for supplies, which he did on a <coughs> specified Saturday. And the local dock uh, proceeded to check him all over and allow how the man was actually in a perfect uh, physical shape. He was practically a medical specimen. He was in such good shape. There was nothing that the medical science could do to solve his problem. But the doctor did suggest that the next time he went into the field with the plow, that he take a shotgun with him. And when he felt that urge coming on, he'd fire the shotgun and run for the farmhouse. And his wife, hearing the report, she'd run for the field. <laughs> now, God willing, uh, they'd get together in time. <laughs> The young fellow thanked him very much and uh, paid his bill and uh, went back to the farm. Now the summer went and uh, fall came and went, winter, spring, it really wasn't until the next summer that that doctor saw the young fellow in town again. And when he did, he rushed across the street, went up and uh, sort of clapped him on the back and he said, well, sir, young fellow, he said, the young fellow says, not, not good, doc. I said, no, sir. Well, did, didn't you try my suggestion? He said, oh, yes, we well, tried it all right. And, oh, well, what happened? He said, well, doc, he said, to tell you. It worked all right for a spell, but come hunting season, my wife ran herself to death. <laughs> Shifting the scene of our discussion just a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Shifting our discussion to the part of the state that's well known both here and outside the state. That's Aristic County. Now, as we all know, Aristic County is the world's largest potato growing county. And when the price of potatoes is good, they really live it up. When it isn't, well, it's just the reverse. This was back during the times when perhaps prices were a little higher than they have been of late. And the scene is the Bangor house in Bangor. As you realize, any time these fellas really uh, strike it good in the potato market, about the only place you can let off steam is in Bangor. Now, this potato farmer from Aristic was uh, checking into the Bangor house. And on duty that night, behind the counter was a young fellow just starting out in the hotel business. He was eager to make good. And he was trying everything he could to improve himself as a hotel man. As the farmer checked in, the young fellow was reading his registration upside down, and he said, Welcome to the Bangor House, sir. And the farmer said, Yeah. Hey, you in town on business of pleasure? Business. We have lots of facilities here at the Bangor House. Perhaps we can be of assistance to you. Perhaps. Anything particular I can do for you? At this point, the farmer said, Well, I'm looking for 50 whores. <laughs> <laughs> Well, at this, the uh, young fellow was kind of taken aback, and uh, he hadn't quite heard that before, at least in that uh, number. <laughs> he leaned across the counter, and he said, you mean prostitutes? Mama said, well, son, I tell you, I don't reckon I care what religion they are, as long as they dig potatoes. <laughs> That'll teach you not to get ahead of me. <laughs> There's a little town in Maine called Millinocket. 
Now, for those of you who don't know, Millinocket is the home of the Great Northern Paper Company. And there are those people that uh, find it necessary to do business by driving to Millinocket. Now, as you can readily ascertain by reading a map, in order to get to Millinocket, you've uh, got to start at Bangor and go through uh, Orono and Old Town, uh, through Pasadumkeg, cross the bridge and turn left, and then proceed to go for about 25 miles through uh, practically nothing. On this particular day, this young machinery salesman had a 12 noon appointment uh, at the Great Northern Paper Company in Millinocket. So uh, doing the prudent thing, he spent the night in Bangor, which as you can understand was very quietly spent. He rose early in the morning uh, to get underway, and he followed the prescribed route. He went through Orono, Old Town, reached Pasadumkeg, did cross the bridge and turned left. While he was on that 25 mile straightaway, he noticed that his watch had stopped. Now this did perplex him a little bit because he was due in Millinocket at 12 noon. He'd never been there before. And this was a rather important uh, uh, business uh, uh, meeting. So he was looking for a way to do, uh, find out what time it was, in particular where he was uh, in relation to Millinocket. As he rounded the bend of the road, he noticed a farmer sitting there by the side of the road uh, with his cow. Now the cow was munching on the state grass, which of course is a local prerogative up here. <laughs> so he stopped the car and got out, went up to the farmer, and he said, pardon me, sir, but uh, do you suppose you could tell me what time it is? Well, sir, the old fellow looked him up and down once or twice and loud how he probably could, yes. Whereupon he turned around and reached underneath the cow and sort of took hold of the cow's udder and lifted it once or twice, looked back at the stranger and said, it's ten minutes to twelve. <laughs> well, with this, the traveling salesman said, uh, thanks a bunch, you know. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> proceeded to get into his car and drive off. But well, for the lack of nothing better to do, he did set his watch at 10 minutes to 12. 10 minutes later, he was in Millinocket. As he went by one of the local gas stations, he looked, uh, looked at the clock over the door and it said 12 noon. And son of a gun, the old timer was right. And this fellow just couldn't get it out of his mind. And all during the meeting, he thought of that, that man sitting by the side of the road with the cow. As soon as the meeting was over, he hopped into his car and went right back out the same road, which is about the only road that you can go out. <laughs> <laughs> Hoping that uh, the man would still be there with his car. Well, sure enough, uh, he reached the, uh, reached the same spot, and uh, there the farmer was sitting, and uh, his car along with him, uh, still watching on the state grass. Well, he got out of the car and uh, went up to the farmer and said, uh, pardon me, but uh, perhaps you remember I was by here this morning? And I said, yes. Uh, you, you told me what time of day it was, and quite frankly, I uh, just couldn't uh, get over how you did it. And I was wondering, uh, it, you know, just, just to be sure you weren't pulling my leg, uh, if you could tell me what time it is now. Well, the, the old timer looked him up and down once or twice, and uh, allowed how perhaps he could, yeah. <laughs> he turned around and uh, once again proceeded to reach underneath the cow and take all the cows out her and lift it up uh, once or twice. He looked back at the stranger and said, it's 20 minutes after four. Son of a gun, the old timer was right. Exactly. The young fellow said, look, uh, look uh, uh, this is amazing. This is simply amazing. He said, uh, you've got to tell me how you do it. Now, I'll be honest with you, I've never been here before, and, uh, and uh, chances are I'll never be back again, and, and I just can't leave without you telling me how you tell time like that. The old timer said, well, son, I'll tell you. He said, uh, it ain't so much, it ain't so much at all. He said, all I do is uh, just lift up the cow's head, uh, and I can see the town hall clock. <laughs> <laughs> There's a little story they tell up in Greenville, which is not what you could really call a, a humorous story. It's not one that I'm sure you're going to get uh, lots of chucks out of, but uh, perhaps it's something we could all take a lesson from. This is one thing I... I like about uh, main stories, there's a little lesson to be learned in just about every one. And this is one that we perhaps can, can all think of in terms of ourselves and people that we meet. There was up in Greenville at that time a trapper, a fox trapper, and by the name of Austin Littlefield. Now Austin was well over 70 years of age. 
But he was renowned in the whole territory as being absolutely the outstanding fox trapper that ever emerged upon the scene. Every spring he would come to market with the most luxuriant, the largest fox pelts of any trapper in the area. He had lines stretched out around those lakes uh, to the, uh, would nearly disappear there so long. But somehow he had a secret that was just unbeatable. Well, as I said, uh, Austin was in his 70s. And word got around Greenfield one year that uh, Austin was thinking of retiring. Seems he had a sister in Bangor. And he was thinking that perhaps that winter he'd uh, give up his lines and go into Bangor and spend it uh, with his sister. He figured he didn't have too many years to go and uh, family ties were beginning to get to him. Well, as word got around town, there was a young eager beaver and he could have been active in one of the local clubs that got him all the spirit to get out and do things, but he began to think that uh, perhaps Austin had something that was worth buying. And that was his secret, fox trapping. So he made his proposition to Austin that for $25, he'd buy Austin's secret of being the most renowned fox trapper in the whole area. Well, the good trapper thought it over. Quite obviously, he didn't make a hasty decision. And he learned how $25 was at that time, $25. And he rightly didn't know if he was going to come back again after spending the winter down in Bangor. So he agreed to sell. And at the appointed time, they sat down in the local cafe and had a cup of coffee. And after the proper exchange of $25, where Austin proceeded to spell out step by step exactly what he had done to make him the top fox trapper in the whole area. With that accomplished, he packed off and went off to Bangor for the winter. Well, come spring, when the sap began to flow in the trees and so forth, why, he got the urge to go back to Greenville, which he did. On his first day back, he spied the young fellow there walking down the main street, just as proud as light. And full of excitement and anticipation, he rushed up to him, grabbed him by the arm, and said, What been going? And the guy says, Not good, not good a bit. He says, Dang. He said, How, ma how many foxes did you get? He said, I didn't get an area one. He says, You didn't? He says, No, sir. Well, didn't you try my suggestions, my secret plans? He says, no, I didn't. He says, why not? He says, well, I thought of a better way. They do tell a story about uh, one particular farmer that had a pet cat. The cat had been in the family a few years, and all of a sudden, uh, lo and behold, the cat wasn't feeling too well. And they really didn't know what was wrong. It had gone on for about a week, and the cat was moping around. And finally, his wife prevailed upon him to check in with the local vet uh, while he was in town for supplies. So this particular Saturday, he dropped by the vet and uh, explained his particular situation about the cat. Unfortunately, the vet getting on in years, couldn't hear too well. And he thought the farmer said calf rather than cat. And he allowed how this was a, a well-known symptom this time of year, and about all he had to do was give the critter a quart of castor oil and be all right in no time. <laughs> the farmer, not knowing uh, too much about the subject, thanked the vet very much and proceeded to go back uh, to the farm, uh, take the little kitty cat by the scruff of the neck, and... Uh, Pour a quarter castor oil down his throat. <laughs> About two weeks later, the two gentlemen met in the village store, and uh, the vet looked up, and <laughs> he saw Albert coming in. He says, Albert, he said, uh, how's that calf of yours? Albert said, oh, Doc, I ain't got no calf. He said, uh, I'm a potato farmer. I ain't got no herd. You know that. And Doc said, uh, well, Albert, you were in my office two weeks ago and said you had a sick calf, and I prescribed a quarter castor oil. He says, oh, Doc, you don't hear so well. I said, cat. C-A-T. So, well, good God, man, you didn't give that critter a quarter castor oil, did you? He said, of course I did. You told me to. That <laughs> says, how is the little thing? He says, I don't know. He <laughs> so, what do you mean you don't know? He says, well, Doc, I can tell you, the last time I saw it, it was going over yonder hill with five of its buddies. <laughs> two digging, two burying, and one looking for new ground. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.
<laughs> Earlier we were talking about roads in the state of Maine and how important it is. Occasionally some of our brethren uh, venture to uh, travel outside the state. On this particular day, this fellow was sitting on his porch. Uh, it was early on a Thursday morning. He looked down the road and he saw his neighbor coming up, all dressed up in a Sunday go to meet and suit. Had a black coat, black hat, and had a Bible under his arm. Of course, he waited till his friend got right opposite the porch. And he called out, Amos. Amos, where are you going? Amos said, I'm going to Boston. Says, is that a fact? He said, sure is. He says, Amos, what you going to do there? He says, well, I heard a lot about them whorehouses, he said. I thought I'd try one out. He says, is that a fact? He said, sure is. He said, Amos, uh, what you got the Bible for? Well, he said, uh, if I decide to like it, I might stay over Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> As most of you know, uh, the economy in the northern part of the state sort of rests upon a corporation known as the Bang on Rustic Railroad. And north of Lincoln, there's a stretch of 15 miles straight away that's uh, well known by the engineers on the road. Whenever they're looking to make up five or ten minutes, they sort of look forward to that straightaway so they can kind of open her up and uh, make up on the time. Now, as you know, the Bang on Rustic's uh, principal uh, reason for being in business is hauling potatoes to market. On this particular day, there was a car made up, about 110 cars of uh, Arista County potatoes heading for market. And the engineer was about 10 minutes late. He sort of looked forward to that straightaway, and as he round the bed, bend heading into it, why, uh, he opened her up full throttle, and off he went. Well, seven and a half miles down the track was an old trapper. Standing four square right in the middle of that track, waving that train down with his uh, black and red Mackinac. Now, fortunately, the, uh, the engineer saw him in time. And he managed to stop about, uh, yay much from the old-timer, who, of course, uh, stood right there on the track uh, to be sure the train stopped. <laughs> Making sure the train was stopped, he kind of walked around, looked up at the cab, and the engineer leaned out and said, What's wrong? The old-timer said, Do you want to buy a possum? <laughs> Buy a possum? You just stopped 110 cars of Bangor on a rustic railroad full of potatoes, load of mac and blood, etc., etc., etc. Get the hell out of the way. <laughs> Old fellow loud as how he would, if that's how you felt about it. Whereupon the engineer started her up again laboriously, car after car uh, went by. As the last one went down the track, the old fellow kind of scratched his head and, and uh, he said to himself, uh, I don't know what he's so head up about. I ain't shot it yet. <laughs> there was a time up in North Anson when this uh, when this tourist stopped by during hunting season, a uh, general store, and uh, seemed he was needed supplies. And at a particular time, the parson was in there talking to the storekeeper and uh, overheard the conversation. When the tourist came in, he said, "Howdy." The storekeeper said, "Howdy." <laughs> Said, uh, my son and I are up here doing a little, uh, little hunting, and we decided we needed some blankets. It's uh, might colder than we thought it would be. Have you got any in stock? The storekeeper allowed how he did, reached around on the shelf and brought down a blanket, put it down on the counter, said, that'll be five dollars. Torres kind of felt it a mite and looked at it and said, that you wouldn't have one that was perhaps a little, uh, little more expensive than that? The storekeeper said, uh, Oh, yes, I do. He reached around, brought down another blanket, put it on top of the first, and says, that's $10. The tourist looked at it in mind and said, you, you just wouldn't happen to have another one that perhaps was a little more than that, would you? And the proprietor said, well, uh, as a matter of fact, I do. <laughs> yes. He reached around, brought down another one, put it down, and says, that's $15. The tourist looked at it a spell and said, sold. So they exchanged the money. The tourist went out happy and uh, drove off uh, to do his hunting. Whereupon the parson turned to the proprietor and he said, uh, I couldn't help but over, overlooking that, Edmund, he said. Uh, I noticed you took those three blankets down from the same pile. Now, you don't reckon that was the right thing to do, do you? The proprietor said, well, parson, I tell you, it's right there in the good book. It says, welcome the strangers and take them in. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
Then I overheard one about the little old lady who got into a taxi cab here in Portland. Said to the driver, he said, Driver, take me to where I can get scrawd. <laughs> <laughs> Driver turned around and said, Lady, I've been driving for 25 years, and that's the first time I've ever heard that in the past Pooh Perfect. <laughs> Speaking of fish. <laughs> This evening would be a complete failure if it hasn't already been. Uh, if we didn't have one story about lobstering. Now these two fellows named Ephraim and Silas was out lobstering one night when this gale blew up. And it was really a question whether or not they'd get back to shore. Whereupon Ephraim turned to Silas and he said, Silas, I think you'd better get up in the bow and do a little praying while I steady the boat. Which Silas proceeded to do. Sure enough, the gale sort of died down and Ephraim was able to head it toward shore. Whereupon he said to Silas, Silas, think you'd better stop praying now. We don't want to be beholden to no one. <laughs> Quite often in the summertime, as I'm sure you know, we get uh, lots of young fellows with the sports cars that like to... Uh, tear up some of our back roads and uh, kick up a lot of dust. On this particular day, one young fellow who was uh, sporting a brand new model came careening around the corner just a mite bit faster than they should have, and unfortunately, one of the local uh, gentlemen in business was taking his cows home for the evening right across the center of the road. And the fellow was just going too fast to stop, and he proceeded to whack one of those bovines right in the behind, <laughs> knock it right into the ditch, and it took him about 100 yards to stop the car. Whereupon he got out and walked back, and by this time, the critter had uprighted herself and uh, was standing four square in the middle of the road again. The young fellow kind of walked around it a bit and uh, walked up the fire, and he said, well, she looks okay to me. Lama said, well, son, I tell you, you think you've done her any good, I'd be glad to pay you for it. <laughs> <laughs> One of these fellows wasn't quite as lucky, and under a similar circumstance, uh, the fellow in the sports car completely did in his cow, uh, killed it, in other words. And uh, the farmer was faced with a thing he never had had to do before. He had to fill out an insurance form. And he got to the line that said disposition of carcass, and he put down <laughs> kind and gentle. <laughs> Now, up north of Matawum Keg, not to be uh, confused with Pasadam Keg, two completely separate communities, about 60 miles due north into the woods from Matawum Keg, two fellows had a two man lumbering operation. Two fellows by the name of Albert and Sam. Now, they only came out for supplies about every year, year and a half. And when they did, they used to trade down at the uh, general store there at Matawum Keg. The proprietor, he liked to josh them an awful lot because they were kind of naive. On this particular time, Albert was down there all by himself. And in the course of the conversation, he said to the proprietor, he said, how's that fellow Spofford doing for us down in Augusta? The proprietor said he ain't there no more, you know. Said he ain't? Said, no, sir. The county elected a new man last time around by the name of Gagney. Said, you don't say. Said, sure do. What's more, he's a Catholic boy. Said, you don't say. It's the first one ever had, isn't it? Said, sure is. And they say down Augusta, he's putting holy water in the toilets. <laughs> he says, you don't say. He said, sure do. So when did I get back and tell Sam? He loaded up the wagon and off he went into the woods. <coughs> well, six or seven days later, he ran into Sam and he said, Sam, you'll never believe what I heard down the general store. They say that fellow Spofford ain't down Augusta no more. He says, he ain't. He said, no, sir. County elected new man by the name of Gagney. He says, you don't, you, you don't say. He said, sure do. What's more, they say down the general store, he's Catholic boy. Says, he is. It's the first one ever had, isn't it? Said, sure is. And they say down at the general store that he's putting holy water in the toilets. Said, you don't say. Said, sure do. Albert, what's a toilet? 
<laughs> so don't ask me, Sam. I ain't Catholic. <laughs> Just to verify these things actually do happen, <laughs> I'll tell you one that's a first-hand story, as it did happen to me, and it happened to me in a town called Dover Foxcroft. To those of you that are quite familiar with Dover Foxcroft, this town used to be two towns, Dover and Foxcroft. It might be called one of the first uh, such cases of urban renewal, they decided to merge. <laughs> but they couldn't decide what to call the merged town, so they ended up with a hyphenated Dover Foxcroft. And as it stands now, whenever they appropriate something for the high school, which is on one side of the river, they appropriate something for the town hall, which is on the other side of the river. Well, this particular night was a Saturday night in Dover Foxcroft, and I needed gas about 10.30. And I think you understand that there perhaps was not too much competition for my business at 10.30 on Saturday night in Dover Foxcroft. So I stopped about the only station I saw that was open and uh, pulled up to the gas bay, got out of the car, went into the station house where there was a teenager who was operating it at this time. And he had a few of his friends with him who were probably waiting for late dates or something. As so they walked in, the young, young fellow came up to me, uh, wiping his hands on a cloth, and he said, you want some gas, mister? I said, yes, would you fill it up, please? He looked out the window and said, which one's yours? Without batting an eye, one of his friends said, the one that ain't moving, you fool. <laughs> When it comes to firemen, one of my favorite stories is one I heard firsthand. Came, uh, came at my wife's in-laws one time. And I was sitting there with two brothers who ran a truck farm. And we were discussing farming, gentleman farming, on my part, that is. And the conversation got around to corn, sweet corn, how to grow it, how to cook it. And one of these fellows said to me, he said, the only way to eat corn is to get the water boiling rush out to the farm, grab that corn off the stalk, come back and chuck her fast, toss her in the boiling water, and eat it right after. He said, when you do that, you get all the sweetness, goodness of the corn. In fact, it's so sweet, you don't even need any butter. With that, his brother, without even looking at his kin, said, got to have the butter, makes a salt stick. <laughs> As you know, some of these uh, small churches here in the small town churches here in the state of Maine practice what we know as hellfire and brimstone religion. They tell a story up at the Bald Hill Baptist Church about a kindly old lady by the name of Emily Titcom, who'd had the same pew in this church for nigh on to 55 years. She'd come every Sunday sit down and take in the sermon, uh, along with a few comments to whatever neighbors happened to be sitting beside her. Well, on this particular Sunday, it was a special time at the Bald Hill Baptist Church because they had a visiting preacher from down south representing the Southern Baptist Convention, and he was about to give them one of the biggest hell, fire, and brimstone talks they'd ever had. And he was waxing elegant that day. In the course of the sermon, he said, We are going to eradicate all sin." Emily turns to her neighbor and says, Amen. Amen. Whereupon the preacher says, We is going to eliminate all tobacco. Emily turns to her neighbor and says, Amen. Amen. Preacher says, We is going to eradicate all liquor. Emily turns to her neighbor and says, Now he's meddling. <laughs> <laughs> In closing, I'd like to say just one thing. It's a common expression here in the state of Maine. It's one I kind of appreciate. If we don't meet in the future, we're down sure is going to meet in the past year. <laughs> <laughs>